So um, in this discussion tonight, what we want to do is, uh, it, first of all, um, Monroe is a new artist to our gallery. And this is our first presentation. And uh, what we decided to do is do it as a um, exhibition, a, a digital exhibition and doing the opening tonight. We just also had a snowstorm here in New York. So we're doing the uh, opening tonight um, with Zoom and uh, digitally. And there's um, a lot of installation images on the website. There's tons of paintings on the website. So what I'd like to do is just introduce um, Monroe now. Let me flip the screen. And this is Monroe and uh, say hello. Hi everybody, glad you could be here. And um, I think what we'll do is we'll give a little bit of a scan of the show. And, um, what, and then what we'll do is uh, kind of talk as we go along. And I'm going to start here on this wall. First of all, let me just say um, the exhibition is comprised of about 16, 18 paintings. And they range in size from um, several very large paintings that are like in the 72 by 50 sort of size range. And um, there are also a number of uh, sort of medium size uh, paintings. And that's uh, the wall that I was going to start at right here. And these range between 30 and 40 inches in size. And then there's a number of smaller 18 inch paintings um, that uh, she's that are very recent. Yeah. And um, so what I'm doing here is just giving you an idea of some of these uh, sort of mid sized paintings. So this one is called Stopping Rain. So what I'd like to do is, as you can see, I just want to give you many of you I know who are joining this are already familiar with um, Monroe and are, are doing this. I should also point out, we're doing this as a webinar. So if you are trying to speak and you're wondering why we aren't seeing you and you're not popping up, we're doing this as a webinar so that we can kind of focus on the discussion right now with um, Monroe. And there are a number of things about her work and process and about the compositions that I'd like to cover this evening. And what we'll do is we'll open this up to a Q and A um, after we go through uh, a, a chunk of the discussion and then um, and allow you to ask some questions and then we'll go back to covering uh, some of the other um, material we, we, that uh, she after your questions she may have some other things she might want to say or, or add to that. Um, I just want to say a word about this painting, March of the Zapotec. Okay. So this was one of the first ones I did after I left my beautiful studio in the Bronx and moved back to my um, crowded and disheveled basement at the bottom of our house and was really bereft. Finally, I noticed in the corner of the basement there was an old box of oil paints. I took them out and I also had a lot of old um, paintings sitting around down there. So I got out one of my favorite paintings in the oil and just started going and something just sort of magical happened. And I particularly felt it with this painting. Okay, so that kind of gets to then some of the things around process. Um, so let's just start kind of at a high level. When you look at uh, these paintings, that's why I wanted people to have a little bit of a, a view of the people who may not be familiar, even people who know you, Monroe, um, may not uh, appreciate uh, this new work or have realized you've kind of gone to this. Um, so I'm just scanning now. That was another like 36 by 36. And here's an, a range of these a smaller 18 inch painting. So I just wanted the uh, audience just to have a, a feel for the work Did, could I say a word about as that? we start talking about it. Yeah. Okay. Which one in particular? Um, Requiem for RBG. This is again a painting dear to my heart as RGB was. And the day I heard she died. RBG. Yeah. Okay. RBG. I pulled out my canvases, found one that was really a very bright red, 
and started working on it, thinking about her and how much she meant to my life and to so many women. And uh, this, this painting. And just to make sure people who understand, this is, she's referring to Ruth Bader Ginsburg who passed away, was on the Supreme Court for a number of decades. So uh, that's this particular painting, that's the title of it, Requiem for RBG. So now that we have an idea of just a couple of, of, of these things, why don't we talk about sort of your process and, and content? So just, we're still trying to socially distance Monroe. <laughs> so, all right, so um, what, um, what I want to get to is when you first look at this work, the impression is a number of things. One is there's a lot going on. There's a, a lot of content. And when you look at it more carefully, this is a, a good painting to point out some of these things. You clearly have a ground and it's um, very vibrant with a lot of movement. It looks stained. Um, so, and you've, you had told me that it is uh, dilute uh, glazes of acrylic yes. and it's dribbled and poured and what have you. And then layered on top of that are these oil patches, these, these uh, segments which you view as um, individual small paintings. Yes. So the, all of the activity that we see going on is really um, a montage, if you will, of many small paintings that you create in a rectilinear format on top of a very um, lyrical with a lot of movement sort of background and very vibrant and uh, often uh, fluorescent colors. Yeah. And your oil paintings are small paintings that are generally very horizontal, geometric. Some of them are repeated. Um, there's a little bit of patterning going on in here, but by and large, what you try and do, and I'm gonna zoom in for people on some of these, as you've explained to me in the studio visit that we did, what you like to do is really, well not do, what happens is you get sort of moved, if you will, or inspired. Oops, that's not what I probably should have done. So, um, and what you do is you sort of run with it. And so this oil painting, and you said oil painting uh, means a lot to you. And so there's a lushness and a thickness. And what you do is you spend a great deal of time. Um, they're not just slathered. You actually work these a lot. So you apply, you subtract, you add, and you keep working these as little mini paintings. And what I'm gonna point out is this one right now is one of these patches. And this is one that kind of is a little bit of an anchor in that it recurs again. And there's a, another sort of version of it down here. And so what ends up happening is, is these become anchors in your paintings. Oh, there's another one up here. So there's, there are variations on the theme, if you will. So say more about what gets you sort of carried away and going on these and why, what makes some of them repeated and some not? Well, as I was telling you, I don't do any drawing. I'm not one of those artists who makes everything in black and white and then fills in the line with color. I begin with color. So color mm -hmm. is actually the structure of my painting. So you see here, sometimes it's very muted. Like this piece and this piece are, as David called them, anchor pieces in this work. And uh, the, one, the darker ones that he pointed out hold it in place. Everywhere you see a mark, there's some kind of parallel mark that says something about it. You see these three yellows? So it all locks together in the end through the process of color, rather than through drawing or creating some kind of shapes that work against each other. My work is really fully cut out of color. Now, uh, you also had mentioned that in prior it mentioned to me in prior teaching positions, you taught color, um, but you, so you obviously know color theory and about color interactions and all sorts of things, but um, you tend to like to break those rules and kind of, as we shall say, color out of the line. <laughs> and um, so. Well, for example, if yep. I could show you this painting, mm -hmm. 
It's essentially a red, yellow, and blue painting. Yes. And the painting works because it revolves around those three colors. And it sort of holds it in place. Again, again you see an acrylic background. This painting, I uh, challenged all of that. And uh, it really doesn't depend on a particular traditional color harmony to hold its own. It's really these building blocks that I've placed mm -hmm. that keep it stable. Yeah, and at the first glance, you don't, and that's one of the things about these paintings is they're, at first glance, um, you don't see all that. What you see is a lot of movement and color and ac action. And then you start zeroing in on them and you start, where sometimes you squint your eyes or if you look at an image of it, then you start seeing these uh, repetitive elements. And so the repetitive, el repetitive elements end up, um, acting as an anchor and then you know there's obviously you zero in on a lot of things um and most of them i would say are very impasto very thickly layered they tend to nod a little bit towards a seascape or um you know a landscape and i say that because um there is often um a horizon line in almost everything because a they're horizontal which is classic landscape format and um and like here you see this red in the center and then the green and the the white above so is it a sunset is it sunrise so there's a little bit of a nod to that not that you're really emulating a landscape but just inherently i'm just saying when you have that shape and you have a horizon line it blend you to that. And some of these palettes, you can even see that. But some of these paintings, so let me um, just point to something. Then there's other passages like this one um, where it's very different, um, where there's like a little bit of color mixing or something going on where they have these like little peaks. So- yeah. it's see, that's very different from today. The yes. Right here, yeah. where you see it's all blended together and, you know, gone over and over and over that. And finally, to the dotted the red right over that, over that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really a lot different than just a little stroke that changes things. Mm -hmm. And really, it's infinite. I just go on and on and on and discover more. So let's move to a different painting though. Um, but I wanna get to talking about the grounds and um, versus the, I hate to say figure versus ground, but um, there is a, a very strong ground here. And then you clearly have these, uh, these patch areas are um, with the oil paint on top or are definitely sort of the, the content. Um, here you have these repetitions in this one of these black and white. Yes. Again, that's color as structure, holding it yeah. together. Yeah, well, that's the other thing too. So let's touch on a couple things on this painting. So you see these black and white ones. So well, you had mentioned that you like structure um, so that you can sort of organize uh, the, and think about your, your color harmonies and relationships and what have you. So speak more about that. And, um, and maybe you should start with the grounds first because obviously it has to go down first. Well, the grounds are... Um, just truly free form and uh, I like to think they're taking a flyer in the sense that they drip and move and uh, turn fluorescent and then turn very somber and do all kinds of things. So there's no end to what I can do with the ground. And some of them are actually some of my old paintings that I just worked over. But uh, one thing I'd like to say here is that in certain places, you don't really see that figure ground relationship. And actually what I'm doing right now is working more and more on a blending of the figure and ground and a, a sharp delineation to create a certain kind of interest, tension, mm -hmm. feeling. And uh, one thing I mentioned uh, to you before is though my work is rooted in modernism, I feel that it's moved gradually over time to the century we live in now with a very multicultural, multi-phased communities. And I try to express 
both the female, which I think of as the background, and the more male, which I think of as the strong stroke, along with um, other forms and other ways in which we are very highly cultural. And I think that's important too. Look at how we are now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the grounds are, are more feminine. The, these geometric structures are definitely more masculine. Um, they're not really in a, a, a true grid format, but they're definitely, they do have a gritty geometric feel about them. Well, to see if you look closely, I, I make these lines on canvas. Yeah, some of these you can see sort of that. Uh, yeah. I always leave them because mm -hmm. they're part of what makes up the painting. Right. And the other thing um, that I was thinking is, you know, you sort of think of yourself as a, a geometric abstractionist. But there's clearly a little bit of, um, you know, they're very lyrical, very gestural. Sometimes you use palette knives, sometimes you use, uh, you know, brushes. Um, Pieces of cardboard. Yeah, so there's a lot, you know, a lot of different sort of materials. I mean, the material aspect is really important to them. And, um, and that's what's sort of interesting, I think, about the smaller ones is the smaller ones have sort of like a, a little tighter composition because it's it's a little less territory uh, to cover. And so, um, yeah. and you really, some of them have more, I don't know, I would never say monochromatic. Go ahead and see over there a little closer. And then um, I would never say they're monochromatic, but um, they, they tend to, when you look at them, you see a color. But, so this one definitely yeah. has sort of an apple green or limey green color. It yeah. sort of jumps out even though there's a lot of red. And so that was the undercolor yeah. of this piece. And, and I like the fact that the sides are sort of that still underpainting. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, here, you know. You need to speak up a, a, a little bit more. People are saying they have a hard time hearing you. Okay. So, so uh, I'm not at all afraid to be messy because I think that gives a feeling of the process and the sort of hands-on involvement with the piece. So uh, in some places, you know, I'll slap the painting on. Now here, there's a yellow painting underneath. And I often work with underneath colors and how they work with the over colors. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I just turn into uh, little slabs of paint. Mm -hmm. And then this one has uh, a little bit more geometry going on in it. Let me zoom in on it real quick so people can see it. And you can see where there's an underpainting, there's like cubic, like little line painted boxes yeah. that you've then painted over. Yes. And then this one definitely has a very blue feel to it. Yeah. And then RBG is a very hot, um, sort of a red orangey color, um, which is probably a good color for her. Everybody thinks of her sort of fiery and fierce. Um, and then this one definitely has sort of a yellowy, ambery sort of color to it, sort of a feel. And so like here, if a, if a bit of painting just drops right down, I like that. You just leave it, yeah. Yeah, it's part of like the freshness of the piece. Sorry, everybody, I just was reaching for something. <laughs> but, um, okay. And then this one, um, we're deviating a little bit from my planned thought about the discussion, but this one, uh, talk a little bit about this because now you sort of have things going at angles. It's, and and I, I, interestingly, they form like a triangle on there, these sort of red and white, mm -hmm. You See, know, there's a elements. red and white triangle right there, mm -hmm. and then there's a green kind of wash through. Mm -hmm. And this, I would say, is my most exuberant painting. Mm -hmm. I uh, just could not stop myself. This painting just poured out of me, and I could feel it getting thicker and more crowded. And I decided that's part of what it's about. That's part of what it has to say. Is this kind of crowded exuberance, so just let it go. And it's got this sort of orangey sherbet uh, ground. <laughs> yeah. Um, it looks sort of like a, a, one of those orange push-ups that we used to have when we were in the kids in the 60s. But it's, it's got little see, splashes of other things on it. 
So for the crowd, I'm just going in on some detail here. So we're passing over some of these that are traditional sort of rectangles and some that are sort of turned topsy-turvy. You know, even in the ABEX realm, you know, um, Nina uh, Trigvedat is an artist we represent. And um, Nina was known back in the late 40s and 50s for these sort of um, blocks that were very impasto and um, not as colorful as your work, but um, she always liked having her work sort of structured and organized, even though it was abstract expressionist. Mm -hmm. These sort of blocky forms sort of emerged and they weren't, you know, real discreetly laid out as squares or rectangles, but it was just sort of interesting. Um, and it kind of stuck with me when I saw your work because I, she's one of the few that actually, as I, as I remember doing that, yeah. but uh, there's, you know, but geometry is something that um, I think people find it kind of, um, you know, sort of primal and basic and people I, I, love, I love something about geometry, even though here, you know, it's not as structured or rigored as we think about it or, you know, tight, um, you know, it's, it, it, you've clearly, I think through color and then these, the way you do sort of, you know. Yeah, you see this one has a, a gold painting, yeah. like this color is painted under it. Yeah. And then the top layers are sort of scraped over that. And that's the thing too, that I think people would harmonize with your paintings. Yes, there's a lot going on. Yes, there's some pops of really vivid, like sort of pinks and things like that. Not that you don't have a lot of pink everywhere, I've noticed, <laughs> including your tennis shoes. But um, but I think what it does is since you keep that palette, even though it's presented and represented in different ways in this painting, this orange and blue, these this sort of double pink, you know, these yeah. greens all See, are, awesome. it's like you keep everything on the palette. You don't bring in another color. It's, it's on the palette, you just blend it and, yeah. And so that, you know, the, in terms of just how we traditionally think of oil painting, you adhere to that. It's just that you structure it in a different way and the way you isolate everything, it's not all blended. It has its own sort of identity and, yeah. and voice. And yeah. so what that does is it makes it bolder, stronger. But, you know, when you look at these paintings, the more you look at them, they don't seem chaotic. You just see sort of these yeah. harmonies coming out of them. And what's interesting is that it, there's a lot to take in and, and you view this, a, you know, a lot of times and you still see things, which is, you know, I think really good. Yeah. Uh, I think they sort of um, move near chaos, but just don't really slip over. And it is because of the structure of the colors. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why when you kept saying, I, I really want to make sure people understand that these are the paintings of our times. And all I can think of is like, brother, sister, you got it. I mean, talk about total chaos in 2020. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <know>. like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, oh, somebody just said they, they, they think they look like chunky pointillists. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, uh, that's good. That's a good observation. It's also like there are many characters in the painting. Yeah, and all the different characters have their own voice, and that's the way I see we are today. Also, mm -hmm. there's many groups that all have their own voice. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, okay, so the other thing too we want to talk about is let's move to another painting, a group of paintings. There's plenty here to look at, so we'll just give people a little bit of a view here. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Well, let's go with some that are a little bit different. Like this is a little bit different one. Yeah. But what I want to have you sort of uh, elaborate on is, and we've touched on it in case people haven't noticed. Um, the paintings are um, full of binaries. So you've already talked about them. You've got this mix of media, you know, uh, water-based acrylic, and you've got, you know, um, then these really lush, you know, oil, they're stained in, in impasto. You've got oil and you've got acrylic. Um, we have staining and, and sort of more structured pieces. We have lyrical, we have geometric abstraction. Um, we got male, female, so, you know, hot, cold. 
So there's a lot uh, going on in there, these paintings. In this painting, you see there's a dark line that actually goes right across the painting here. And it's dark blue here and it was white up here. So this painting is called Night and Day. And um, so to me, it has night and Wasn't that a Frank Sinatra and song? <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Chris says this is beautiful. Oh, Cole Porter song. <laughs> day, one. Okay. So the other thing too, and this one I, that struck me in the studio and why I wanted to include it, because this one is a little bit different. Um, on a lot of fronts, but it's these interesting passages um, that are very Richter-esque, you know, where, you know, I know you subtract and add, but this clearly looks like where you sort of had laid out your colors and you sort of with that palette knife moved it across yeah. and got these really interesting sort of, you know, um, jags going on. Yeah. This is another passage down here and that's see, quite see strong. Right there and it's yeah. much bigger. Yeah. There are little bits of that all over. Look at that one. Yeah, these almost have a, this one has a little bit more uh, because of like this passage. There's something that feels a little bit more Native American about it. I don't know if given that you guys live in Colorado a lot, you know, um, and we live in New Mexico a lot. It's just, you know, you start seeing these sort of motifs. Um, and I guess in some ways, you know, these these aren't really squares or cut. They're, to me, I kind of think of them as like you're sort of this language you you like to use in these paintings is like icons or motifs, and they're repeated. Yes, you know, right. That's what they. So are. there's there's something there going on. You know, uh, it seems like as opposed to necessarily purely geometric or or what have you. Um, but they are largely non-objective abstractions. I mean, yes. you know, it's whether you, you've, you have a nod towards, you know, pattern painting or, you know, you're not purely systemic for sure, because like you said, you have little episodes and you kind of go off on tangents and, and stuff, <laughs> you know, um, and this painting seems to be sort of full of those sort of tangents and moments of inspiration. I don't mean that in a negative way. It's like you said, it's because there's something about paint and the color. And it seems like when you see something oozed out or whatever on your palette yeah. that strikes you, then you just kind of run with that, even if that isn't what you had intended to exactly. do. Exactly, exactly. And so, but somehow, because you contain, confine yourself to your palette and those paintings you sort of, you know, limited yourself to from the get-go when you squeezed them out of the tube, you that's why they harmonize, oddly. Yes. Given the diversity of color, but yet there's some harmonization that kind of ties them together when you look at them. Because like this one has a clearly distinct feel from, you know, this other one that we just looked at, you know, a, a few minutes ago. But the process is pretty much the same. You know, all the tenants are there, but it just, they, they read very different, each one of them, which is sort of interesting. It is. And like this one has more drippy things through it. Yeah. The, the, this, this one looks very watery and there's one up there that even looks more like water uh, of that 18 by 18 with that cranberry edge. Oh yeah. That one's very different. We'll work our way over there in a minute. You know, David, I just want to say one thing about this. We're and coming this... back to this one, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Can't let it go. Go on. It's like a big mark of love or something. You know, it's it's very warm and dirty. Well, this patch right here is very unique and distinct. This is what. Yeah. Go ahead and point to it again. I got the phone kind of on it. Right there. Yeah. You see, it's it's it really focuses the painting there. Well, and you can see this is one where you really worked it and gone over it a lot. Yeah. Um, not not in a bad way, but where you kept adding and and there was something you were trying to get to, you yeah. know, with it. And uh, well, I find red is very hard because it's right away dominates mm -hmm. and how to work that in. Let's see, we sort of straight off of my script here a bit, but well, not that have, I had a script, you know, but I mean, about like yeah, I'm just trying to make sure in terms of some of the points we wanted to make sure we got to. Um,
Yeah, I, I really like this one a lot too. You know, I was really inspired on the day I painted this. And when I picked up this board, you see it's, it's um, it kind of sanded yes. off. Yeah. But and at first I thought, oh, I can't possibly use that. And then I realized there was a kind of, it gave it a kind of depth and beauty uh -huh. and, um, you know, it's- well, so I never even noticed that until you just mentioned it. So yeah, it was just something you scraped off of something. It was at the underground, I mean, <laughs> underground, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> underlayment. <laughs> my basement. <laughs> you know, I think it's very hard uh, not to be conventional. We all have so many conventions in our head. And so when something like this happens, I say to myself, I really like the way it looks like a cat fight's been going on right there. And it, it gets a little uh, more angsty and unconventional. Mm -hmm. Let's go up there to those two that you, that we both have mentioned. And there's also this, um, So here, I'll just, here's another one of these small uh, 18 by 18s that have this background, as you can see, is cubes um, done in white. And then they were painted over. I'll zoom in just in case. So there's clear cut geometric work going on underneath this. And this is the other one. Um, and here, this one actually is a good example. You can see these sort of straight lines that she sort of laid down and left that, you know, really pull in in case she didn't get it, you know, sort of a grid uh, func functioning here. But this one really departs a little bit because you kept a lot of that very lyrical, splashy um, ground more yeah. visible yeah. and only put a few of these blocky elements on there. And it's amazing how that completely reads very differently it does so it does. um that was the one i was referring to and you didn't have any others in your studio like this so this one i think is was sort of unique and that's why i wanted to include it because it's um it's very different but i like it and in some ways because of that ground it seems more like there's more of a, a picture or a figuration going on or more intent mm -hmm. you know um so anyhow, that one I thought was very interesting. Um, this is another one. This one's very interesting too, because it's so blue. There's a lot of, uh, you know, blue going on in here, but also um, just lots and lots of, you know, details in each of these little, you know, segments. This are these peels somebody just asked peels no there's no peels but you, you do subtract so how do you subtract in a traditional way you lay it down and then you sort of scrape a little bit or yeah. rub it out or oh, well um i think people meant like peels like when you remove something from a canvas when it was partially dry and it stays like a skin or like if you take the skin off of your um a paint off of your palette yeah and reapply it, a lot of people use peels. Well, oh no, they're not peels. That's what I thought, yeah, they're yeah, not. No, they're um, strokes just meant for that spot. Okay. But I do um, all kinds of things. And I, I li actually like these panels because you can sand, you can get to at your heaviest, you know, grinder. Yeah, that's a good point. We forgot to mention uh, these small 18 by 18s that we're looking at are on a wood panel. Yeah. So they have a lot more um, structure to scrape and do things yes, and a little right. and not have to worry about bowing the canvas yeah. out of shape or something. And I can even use antiseptic claws, which is great for wiping off paint. And then this one's interesting too, because there's a lot of ground still revealed on this one, although it's not as much it's more like it, it was a dribble, you know, as opposed to like the other one, which was big pores or patches. So it just shows the effect of the ground. Well, what I'd like to say is this was actually a complete painting that was in a gallery show. And I always felt not quite there, not quite there. And it, this was, see, there was this kind of arc of white. Yes. It's some blue in the middle. And then there's was kind of an arc of pink up here. Uh -huh. And, uh, I looked at it and I said, I can almost see the painting that's going on that. And uh, 
I, I just could really move quickly because I could feel the both the river and the kind of rocks of the paint meshing together. And uh, for me, this has a, a different sort of composition in that the middle is empty or empty with water and the sides are so stable. And uh, it's not a traditional composition, but that's what I like. Right. And um, this has a couple of really great passages right here. <laughs> this one with the lime green where it's sort of drug across and it's not a complete uh, stripe. Yeah. So that's a good one. I like that. You know, that's I think the, different. the thing is to say, oh, that's a good mark and not scrape it off. You know, a part of you says, get that mess out of there. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's just discipline. So here, we, I, I like this this stroke right here too. So we've covered a lot of ground. I think uh, what we ought to maybe do is um, open this uh, up for some questions. Although I've been trying to catch them as people type them in across the bottom of my screen, I see them, and um, and so. Uh, We've been, you know, able to uh, respond as we as they came across because it, yeah. it was nice because they kind of worked into the conversation. Yes. So um, let's hey, see. Vince. Yeah. Can you go back to the RBG? Someone asked. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. And while we're doing that, I'll kind of walk past these in case that way people can kind of take them in. The titles seem to be more important to you. The um, titles are very important. Yeah, so. Hannibal crosses the Alps. <laughs> say it again now. See, uh, titles. Hannibal, Hannibal crosses the Alps. Yes. That's the painting behind you. That's because it was so hard for me to do this. Oh, I see. Basement. So where do the titles come from? Is somebody named Diane Hobson. Do you know her? As one who asked that. Uh, Oh, where did the titles come from? Yeah, well, no, no, just the title seems significant. So, yeah, oh, but, they're, yeah, they're, but they're along that line, is, where do they come from? Uh, I write a lot of poetry, and they're kind of little haiku, little lines of poetry. Oh, I see. Okay. That pop into my head. So I must. But they are intended to sort of tilt people to a to certain a certain, certain framework point. of thinking. Yes. Now, the March of the Zapotec uh -huh. is actually a piece of music that I played, I found an old um, CD player, and the CD I played it over and over and over again. And it sounds a little bit like a, uh, maybe an Eastern European marching band. Huh. <laughs> so that's the one we're looking at right now. Yeah. Will you let Mona talk about RBG? Yes. Oh, so now, mm -hmm. the, except for RBG, these are all named a certain hour in the castle. Like this is 11 a.m. in the castle. Oh, here, this, this is a good one, the 3 p.m. in the castle. Well, but somebody has a specific question. Oh, what is okay. a specific question about RBG, Richard, do you know? Uh, they just wanted her to talk more about it. Okay, so talk more about RBG. Oh, well, it's hard to say something because I'm very close to this and this being the way I saw her, you know, as really very strong. I just had no hesitation. This isn't really black. This is a uh, deep purple. It's like really dark purple. Yes, yeah. really, and purples and these colors. And I, I saw her as such a, uh, uh, a pioneer, a forward thinking person, a hundred years ahead of her time, saying what she did, doing what she did, and always so self-contained, so confident, so secure. That I'm not I, even going to tell you. She's just the way you're describing her is just the antithesis of somebody else <laughs> <laughs> who lived in the same city. Well, I, I think that was part of it. Is that I needed to find someone like her at that moment, and to to feel that in, you know real intense closeness to her, hmm. the things she believed in, the way she acted, what she stood for for women. So Richard, how do we open this up then? Do I tap participants to see if people have specific questions that they'd like to ask? Yes, there's a chat. 
what? Yes. So tap participants, and then that way it'll show me who's got a question. Correct. Well, most of everybody's been typing it as we go along or asking it in the bottom. So. Okay. So uh, to the audience, um, let me know if there's a specific question. Um, I see there's 36 people online right now. Um, and then we'll have uh, Monroe, you know, answer them specifically. So um, how do I see if people are raising their hands, Richard? I don't see anybody raising their hands. Oh, okay. So. Well, uh, someone zoomed in now. I, how do I? I'm not seeing anything in particular. Okay. So if anybody has any questions, oh, here's a Q and A thing at the top. So Nancy asked if there are cranes in this painting. So Nancy, could you just type in real quick, uh, which painting were you referring to? And you know, if you just type that in, then we'll catch it as it goes across the bottom of the screen. So what else would you, oh, here. Has your creative process been different? Um, has your creative process been different during the time of COVID? Oh, that's a very good question. So yes, yes. it has been. So go, go back and talk about that. Yes, so as I mentioned before, I found myself not in the beautiful artist studio in the Bronx, but I'm very deep in my basement um, feeling incredibly unprofessional and alone, but also far away from the art world or any other influences. I mean, there was just me with me. And as I sat there and started working, found, got out my oils and a few old paintings and began painting, it really 100% was coming from the inside out. You know, there was no filters. So what will they think? You know, none of that. It was just that very direct connection with the paint that truthfully, I don't think I felt that direct a con connection for a long time, long, long time. To the paint, you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you think it is because of the solitude? Yes, and the sort of vanishing of the world. Mm. And that just day after day of being alone and continuing to work. Yeah, because you're a studio. I mean, you sent pictures of it. I mean, it was you know, an, a nice space. I mean, you had lots of big work tables and um, it was actually, you know, not a, a bad studio, but I, I did like your studio in the Bronx. You know, we went to that a couple of weeks ago and um, cause you get that huge window. That makes a huge difference. It does. Um, oh, there's just one other thing I wanted to say. Go ahead. I, we got another question, go ahead. And that is, I began to feel my paintings in this dark, dark, somber time when I was losing people, mm. close people, that there was this somehow this unsuppressible element of hope coming, bubbling up in my paintings. And I just let it happen because there it was. We... Um... Got another question, How and this sort of relates. Oh, the other thing too, let's just to wrap this up. Um, so all these paintings pretty much were done in the last 10 months. They, I did about 30 paintings yeah. in 10 months. So this whole show uh, was born out of the COVID shutdown mm -hmm. and uh, this isolationism. So I think you should do that on a regular basis, but... <laughs> 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 because that's how I am with writing. It's like the only time I can get anything done, but because yes. sometimes it, there is a benefit to that, but too much of it's too much. Yeah. So somebody else wants to know how has all the different countries and cities that you've lived in influenced your work or does it? It, it does. I'm really a person from a lot of places. And I always knew artists and worked with the artists like in Kazakhstan. I had close, close friends who were Russian artists and went out to the steppe to look at the 3000 year old petroglyphs, run my hands over them and really experience the art of that country. And London was a totally different experience. 
uh, very sophisticated, very cynical. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. And then again, I spent a lot of time in Rome, which uh, could be my second home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think everybody gets very inspired in Italy. I to Rome and I said, These are my people. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for them. <laughs> Yeah, and I think people really, uh, it's hard to not be very inspired in like Paris and Rome. Part of it's the architecture, part of it is just the abundance of culture and painting and uh, in the museums. And so I think there's just, yeah. you know, and plus the time, food. <laughs> I lived very early on in my um, adult career, I lived in Indonesia. And I taught myself Indonesian and decided I was going to be a painter but there was no paints to be had in Indonesia. So I had to fly to Singapore, buy everything, come back and set it up. And if one of my friends, Tom Krause is listening, he has one of my first paintings, which I did of the gardener. Of the garden? <laughs> well, it's a guy who worked in our garden. Oh, okay. He sort of came with the house. <laughs> Monroe, Anne yeah. asked, um, would you, uh, Talk more about the masculine feminine in your painting. Oh, yes. Well, um, I think I consider myself, and perhaps we all are, reservoirs of both of those feelings. And so it isn't just, uh, let me find a good one. Here. You know, it isn't just, um, I, I find myself, I'm more than one person. So there's this kind of floating stuff that goes in the background. And this, you know, like right there and these kind of soft, luscious colors. That, you know, to me, that is this uh, dancey, feminine, uh, soothing, embracing quality. And uh, when I look at some of these like this, black and white stroke. Mm -hmm. It has just a totally different quality of uh, like almost like stamping your foot. Well, positive, yeah. negative. It's, yes, yeah. yeah. And like um, sometimes I think of punches in my paintings. That's, a, that's like a punch. Yeah. You know? And Monroe, can you talk briefly about your evolution as an artist? Yes. Um, uh, I, I was always a painter, like everybody's always a painter, or every four-year-old's an artist. <laughs> <laughs> my mother showed my paintings around. And I have to say, it was a big influence on me. I lived in Baltimore, that, that one of my paintings in the sixth grade was taken out of the elementary schools with me and another very artistic guy. We had our paintings hung up in the museum, the Baltimore Art Museum. So I thought, I guess I'm supposed to be an artist. And I tried to stay with it, really, but there wasn't much in the way of education. It was very much off the beaten path to veer into art. But I, I kept doing it in the ways that I could. And- uh, I mean, are you thinking about that in general terms back then? I'm assuming you're talking about like in the 50s, 60s? Yeah. Or are you talking about women versus men? Both, both women versus men and and the way art's taught in junior high and high yeah. school, mm -hmm. you know, it, it doesn't encourage a young woman to be an artist. Uh, and so when I uh, went to Amsterdam one summer, I, had, I couldn't work right then. I didn't have a work permit. And I found this um, uh, limping Spanish guy and our only language in common was French. And he, he was willing to come over once a week and teach me to paint. And I just got so, I was so excited. Just like I do now, I fell into the painting. And that became who I was and what I was going to do. Hmm. Interesting. And you said you t uh, listen to music uh, as you paint. Do you think um, that influences the, uh, your work a lot? Well, um, uh, yes, constantly. And I listen to music at different times in the painting. You know, like there's a, a moment where I'm just really going strong and I'm heading into unknown territory. And I'll listen to anything from, uh, you know, Burna Boy? 
it's kind of, you know, hip hop music to uh, Beethoven's Ninth. You know, anything that kind of pushes me forward, mm -hmm. gives me that leap forward. And then other times, um, I'm wearing with the Bach cello concertos or uh, even some real easy music. So let's see. I like Brian Eno. Uh, so why is the exhibition called Desire in a Gypsy Cloak? Well, because my paintings are extremely emotional and I think they express a kind of desire, which might, you might also call a passion. And the gypsy cloak refers to the way they look. You know, you could, um, maybe we should go back look <laughs> at the pink one. The big one or the smaller one? Uh, so this one has colors that are, you know, could be seen as too wild for New Yorkers, but certainly a gypsy would love to wrap them around her. Well, not too wild, but it would just get filthy on the subway. That's why we like black. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't think anything's too wild for New Yorkers. <laughs> but, yeah, no, this one's, I know I, we talked about the, the thing that you always think about like with gypsies when you think of like these really big patchwork or quilted sort of wraps that they have in their blankets and things like that it's all these you know remnants of things that are all put together yes in a very artful sort of way and lots of these yeah. velours and you know and you know uh, different sort of materials and textured materials so yeah that's I, I totally got the title when you when you said that I the paintings definitely have that vibe to them and yes. um and even like this one over here, which is um, next to it, yeah. there's like these little splashes of like decoration, you know, because these are like things going at different angles. Because this is an interesting painting because you do have these sort of, you know, angled little elements, which unify the painting, um, but they they give it a directionality. But it this one is very distinct when you look at this one vis-a-vis -vis the other one. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's anything that was particularly inspiring to you that day, but you also had the black and white patches here. I do. But much smaller. They're more like, a, a, you know, like, a, you know, almost like um, schmutz, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, it, it was like I was helping myself to read the painting by putting them in. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's why these are like punctuations, you know, these yeah. vertical or yeah. these sort of angled. Um, and they, they also push an orientation. I mean, it clearly wants to read left to right mm -hmm. because of that. And look, it has this really nice background. Yeah, it's got that lavender. So, hmm, so I wonder where that came so from. <laughs> 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 I love purple. Um, let's see, I'm seeing if I missed any other questions. Um, Well, we have kept these people almost an hour, David. Oh, it's been an hour. See how time flies. Well, I think we will probably go ahead and wrap it up then. Any parting thoughts or words of wisdom or something or <laughs> holiday wishes or any? <laughs> well, I'm not wise, so I have no words of wisdom. <laughs> I'm more like a kid. <laughs> Isabella says, great show. Congratulations to you. Uh -huh. And then Jan Valentine says, thank you. Oh, great. So, yeah. So I'm assuming um, the, a lot of these are people you, you know? Yes. Very good. Thank you all so much for coming. And very happy holidays to you all. And check um, this the, um, the gallery website. Um, we've recorded this Zoom. And what we'll probably, and we will post it there. We're also going to be doing a 360 sort of views of the show. There's, um, Fred just took tonight, him and his husband, um, like 30 or 40 installation shots. So um, there'll be lots of ways to enjoy this, even if you're not in New York City um, or, um, you know, um, if you, you, know, you can't, you know, make it in uh, because of uh, the COVID. Um, but if you ever want a video of anything, just contact me, uh, just reach out on email uh, you can reach me at D, just the initial D for David, at davidrichardgallery.com or just go to the gallery website, info at David Richard Gallery, and type a message. And um, I've got little short videos of everything and I can send you more details. So anyway, uh, lots of different ways to kind of enjoy this um, 
given that it's a holiday, bad weather, and uh, a pandemic. But hey, don't let that stop you. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, persevere. So anyway, um, well, I appreciate everybody coming. I'm trying to think if there's any other thing we wanted to cover that we didn't tonight. Um, but I think we got it all. So yeah, stay tuned. We'll probably do a studio visit in a couple months after she has some new things and, uh, and maybe uh, kind of revisit some things. Uh, the more I write about this and think about it, I'll probably have more ideas and thoughts. So anyway, wave goodbye. <laughs> Take care. It's nice to see everybody uh, participating. Thank you so much.